there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so as you've probably been notified by now, if you're an early bird registrant, um, tickets for the Japan Real Estate Summit in Tokyo, Saturday, 6 April, just two weeks from now, uh, as of the publication of this episode, are now live. Um, those discounted early bird tickets are still available for the next 24 hours, but even if you've missed those, admission price is still extremely affordable. And we've added one more guest speaker, Daigo Sato-san, CEO of Sato Tax and Accounting Services. And he'll be discussing tax strategies, tips and tricks for property owners, claimables, deductibles, depreciation, and of course, answering all of your questions during the Q&A panel, uh, which is one of the best segments in these events. So if you've been waiting, wait no longer. Places are limited. And we've already got more than 60 early bird registrants. Uh, In person, streaming tickets are still available, but not sure for how long. So... Hop over to nippontradings.com. That's N I P O N, Nippon Tradings with an S, all one word, dot com. Click on the link to the Japan Real Estate Summit right there at the top of the page and grab your tickets today. All right, so for today's episode, this one's a conversation with Kurt, based in the USA, a longtime listener of the podcast, and he wanted to come on and pick my brain about a very interesting topic that a lot of our clients regularly ask about. He and his family are relocating back to Japan, Shizuoka specifically, and they're very interested in one particular property in their neighborhood that's not listed for sale. So the conversation we've had is all about off-market properties, how to buy those if the seller is either unknown, unlocatable, or even unwilling to sell, how to make offers on these properties, how to handle the approach, negotiation, and communication with property owners who are not necessarily selling their properties, And also some wider topics on how to work with realtors in Japan, uh, particularly the select few that are foreigner friendly, how to create and maintain relationships with them, uh, which incidentally is also going to be the topic of my presentation at our up and coming summit, um, how the brokerage system actually works here, and also a bit about maintenance, renovations and repairs on older homes in Japan, how to try and make sure the relationship with your Japanese neighbors is as good as it can be. And finally, a bit about us here at NTI, how we can assist folks in similar situations and also about the best ways to remit funds to and from Japan. So really nice conversation with a really nice guy on a bunch of interesting topics. Hope you enjoy it as much as I did, and I'll see you again on the other side. Yeah, so I just read through your um, email again. That That's a really interesting story you've got there. I think um, for this episode, I'll just shut up and let you tell it. All right. Very good. Very good. Just let me know however the format works, wherever you want me to start. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do it however, however you like. Well, you mentioned that um, yourself and your wife um, are living in the States for a while, but she's originally from Japan, right? Yeah. Shall I go ahead and give the background? Yes, please. Very, very good. So um, our story, in, in basically in brief, is um, my wife and I, uh, are, are, when we set out, when our daughter was born in 2000, we my wife is Japanese. She's from uh, Shizuoka City, uh, the suburbs of Shizuoka City. Um, and so we set out to uh, give our daughter both countries to the best of our ability. So we raised our daughter from her childhood until age 14 in Shizuoka. And then at age 14, just as she started high school, we brought her back to America. I'm from the Los Angeles area. 
and we uh, settled here and we've been here ever since. Now our, our daughter is graduating from university um, next May. Um, my wife and I are both going to be uh, 60 next next year next uh, year in May. And so we are have decided we're all going back to Japan uh, in, in 2024 to settle down for good. Our daughter to start her career in life and my wife and I to, uh, to wind down our career and start the uh, next phase of our life. What sort of career? What have you and your wife been doing? So I'm an IT project manager. I work in the government sector here. Oh, that's my previous job. That's interesting. Okay. No kidding. No yeah. kidding. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I work. I work here in the government sector. I work for the uh, county of Riverside, which is one of the larger counties here in California. And then my wife, uh, she's a senior administrator with a, a Japanese restaurant chain called um, uh, Gyukaku, which has restaurants in Japan and North America. Okay. And when you say winding down, you're both going to retire now. Is that the, the, the plan? Yes, that's right. So Yumiko's uh, finishing. She's her last. Uh, she's finishing in May, and uh, we've all both already given notice. And uh, she'll be flying. Emily, our daughter Emily, and, and Yumiko will be flying over together in uh, the start of June. I will remain behind until the end of December. So Yumiko and Emily will get everything settled. Yumiko wants to use that time between June, about a half year, June and December, to secure a home for us to purchase it and have it ready. And then I'm going to come over where there are two little dogs and we'll begin our housekeeping at that point. And um, your daughter, you mentioned she's just starting her career. So is she? does she have employment options in Japan that she's already looking into? She does. She spent her summer, this last summer in Tokyo, um, doing an internship with a company that did offer her a job. So she has one job uh, potential, um, but she's also doing her due diligence and going through the normal cycle of new recruit thing uh, for uh, but other potential opportunities. She's she's getting her degree in public relations. So uh, the, we'll see where that leads with the coming AI world, right? But uh, she, yeah, she's looking, looking for, she's currently looking. Okay, so how is, um, you're saying until 14, she was raised in Japan. So I'm assuming her, her spoken Japanese is probably uh, on par with a lot of, um, uh, I mean, definitely better than other foreigners. But how will she do in the Keigo kanji environment, do you think? So she should be all right. She's uh, she's been continuing she, with her mother, of course, speaking and and, and uh, using Japanese. She has had work. She's been working as a social media on, in social media for a company for the last two years for a Japanese a Japanese company. Okay. So from the United States, she's been working part time during her last two years of university in a Japanese in a Japanese company. Fantastic. So. The plan you mentioned that you've already got a property in mind that you want to move into. Can you tell me a bit about that? Sure, sure. I'll just give you a little a, a brief about how we found that place. It might be of might be of interest to people who are looking. So yep. Yumiko and I, when we came up with the idea, we began to narrow down the options. And we knew that as we were getting older, we want to be relatively close to hospitals and clinics. We would love to, we both would love to live in the in in the Inaka, in the countryside, of course, but we have to be practical. So what we did was we made a trip in February, this last February. We took nine days, we went back to Shizuka. Zoka, and we rented a car and we drove around a number of different communities. We were searching for communities, not for houses. We were looking at the logistics of the various areas that we could live, the amenities that are involved. Now, of course, my wife being from Shizoka, she's familiar with a lot of this is all ahead of time, as was I, because I've lived there for uh, you know almost 15 years as well. Um, and then we narrowed it down, and we real we including the Izu Peninsula, and we quickly realized that even though Izu is a great place, beautiful place. Um, it's a little bit tricky if you want to have amenities and especially if you need to see a hospital visit. So, mm -hmm. so we kind of, we were sad to say we scratched uh, Izu off of our list. We even scratched um, Atami off of our list, even though we love Atami and it kind of remains on, on the, on our map a little bit. But just because it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a far, we had such a great time seeing Yumiko's family uh, when we were in Shizuoka. We want to be within, you know, 20, 30 minutes of her family. So what the result was, we narrowed it down to basically a 30, out the outside, 40 minute drive from her family's house, which is in Kusanagi uh, between right. Shizuoka and Shimizu. So that's kind of our perimeter. So then we began narrowing it down even further. We were looking at houses. And while we were in Japan, we actually did. We visited. We went on a big tour, saw about 20 different houses. Uh, it was a great time. It was really interesting, of course, to actually see the places in fact rather than just in uh, on listings. 
What we actually wound up doing was settling on a place that we actually knew. So the, the, the problem is securing it. So here's the house we found. While we were growing up, while we were living and raising our daughter in Shizuoka, um, my wife lives in a tea farming community. Very, very, she has deep roots there. The family's been in that valley for 400 years. So we know everybody. There was one house uh, up, on, up in the mountains, about a 10-minute walk, 15-minute walk from her dad's house that her, her dad's um, best friend in elementary school had it was his house it's a little farm and we used to go up there every year to get takenoko bamboo shoots out of their bamboo forest so we have we they know us we knew them and we learned that the house had been empty and we knew the old woman that lived there she'd been there she'd been our host many times um, and the house had been empty for about four years. She had died, unfortunately. Um, and as it is, as it happens with these places, no one was left to, to take it over. Now, there's only, there's family, there's immediate family around the house. It's a really small little village, um, probably only about 10 houses in the whole village, but it's within walking distance of dad's house. So, but, so the family's all there. They know us, we know them. They, it was actually, they're the ones, the family, the extended family were the ones that like, well, yeah, you guys ought to buy this place, <laughs> right? And so that's yeah. kind of like rare, right? It's like, wow, okay, well, so the extended family is not an issue. The issue is that the sole heir is kind of a prodigal son that never came back. <laughs> right. He's somewhere in Tokyo. He's now the owner of the house. The family, on our behalf, have attempted to reach out to him to say, hey, we've got friends of the family that would like to buy the house and make you an offer you can't say no to. He he won't respond. Right. That's our challenge. So it's not a matter of even locating him. You have located him. He's just not interested in any communication. Is that it? Exactly. Don't know that there's a way around that curtain. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know either. Yeah, so I was I was thinking of things. Um, I don't know. I was thinking of things like, um, you know, um, maybe even. Uh, does this sound far fetched? I mean, like the Japanese detective agencies to to deliver him a letter or something like that. Um. Well, you're saying that the family themselves have. Or attempted to contact him so i'm assuming it's not a matter of you know where he lives or his contact number and so forth right we haven't asked for that but they have reached out on our behalf but, but wife, they know i mean they know where where he they, where to find him they know he won't yeah he doesn't answer the phone so he doesn't even know about the interest he, he won't answer the phone oh okay so the, no contact has actually been made at all right he doesn't know that we have that anybody's even interested have you was that a mobile phone they tried to call him, a landline, a home, or how did they have his number from the registry? You know how this is with Japanese people, right? I could ask my, my wife that question and she won't know. She won't ask those questions. She'll be on the ground in May and she can then begin interacting and doing the subtleties of trying to get to... I We don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. If there's an address, then I'd say a registered post... Uh, registered post with the offer in you know in very clear Japanese obviously maybe not even mentioned that there's gaijins involved mm -hmm. and um, just have it I mean people tend to receive registered postal items because they think it might be something important right um, and, at least but, that'll get him to open the envelope right yeah yeah but I mean um, yeah I don't know that there's any other way beyond that to be honest I mean if the person is not assuming you have they have the address as well which you're saying you don't really know it could be that just the contact number that they have right and my wife will my wife will get more information when she's there right now we're kind of going through her dad and and he's elderly and we don't want to pressure him to to do anything so we're, we're, we're hoping that basically when my wife gets her she could get more information no there was one bit of information that might interest you i did i can't remember i think it was called g show it was a website g show maybe yeah. that i think addresses and i've used it on some of the akia that i was looking at to try to identify it would kind of identify who the owner was right mm. and there was no owner anymore on this one so i'm wondering if something happened and nobody actually owns it anymore well disho is not an official government website so the way to find that out is to um either your wife first because the information is all in the public registry it's not uh, it's not the uh, confidential information anyone's entitled to uh, to go there and ask for it so either your wife herself or you could hire a shiho shoshi a judicial scrivener mm -hmm. They're not that expensive. They usually charge somewhere between fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars per hour 
Oh, with rates these days, it's even less than that. And then he can go to the uh, Legal Affairs Bureau, which is the government entity that keeps all of the owner ownership information on, on assets. Mm-hmm. And that will give you at least the who the owner is and what is the last registered address. Because again, what, what you're saying is it's basically uh, not hearsay per se, but it's essentially un, unconfirmed knowledge in the local community that he is the sole heir and he lives in Tokyo and this is his number, but we haven't really confirmed that, right? I, I think you summarized the situation perfectly. That's right. Yeah. So if you get that information, at least number one, you'll be able to see if he is indeed the owner and what is his last registered address. Mm. Um, which will again make the um, I wouldn't go knocking on his door because Japanese people really don't take well to that. But a registered post parcel will probably be the best thing that you can do in this case. And if for some reason, I mean, nobody owns it. I suppose there are some cases where, you know, um, elderly destitute people with no children pass away and then the government takes ownership. But that's quite rare. If there is a child, then, you know, by default, unless they uh, officially gave it up, by default, they would be the heirs. What I was wondering is if given his disconnect, if he's not, maybe he's not even aware or, or maybe he's not paying the taxes and it's been four or five years. Could we be at a position now where the government is going to reclaim the property for unpaid taxes? Um, they may, but they're not going to tell you when they're going to do that. So the only thing you'll be able to get from government registry is whether the house is still owned by him or not. Not not mm-hmm. anything, whether there's unpaid taxes, all of that information, I don't believe. I mean, it becomes um, it becomes public knowledge when somebody is buying the property and then the, the buyer will receive this information. But I'm not sure if that's the kind of information that will be available to the general public. So... It's more likely that you'll just found out whether he is still owning the property or not. But you're saying she passed away five years ago. Yeah. It normally takes him two years or, I mean, a year has to pass without tax being paid before they'll send in a notification. And then I don't know that they foreclose that quickly. Um, eventually they will, but it could, it could be a lot longer than five years before they'll actually take that action. But I'm assuming... If he is alive and well and he is the official owner, then when the government sends him notifications, he will eventually respond in one way or the other, I'm assuming. I mean, Japanese people don't tend to ignore uh, government directives, right? right? Now, if you've been following this podcast for a while, and in particular our JREP sessions, you're probably more than familiar with Blanca Kobayashi of Arc Reform. They're a bilingual renovation company serving clients in the Kanagawa and Kanto area. So Tokyo, Chiba, Saitama, Kawasaki, Yokohama... They can handle simple, small-scale projects as well as full house renovations, and they will work with you on the perfect design for your dream family home. But not only homes, Arc Reform also handle commercial property renovations, offices, restaurants, bars, shops, you name it, from traditional classics to the latest trends in interior design and renovations. So you want to email them for a free consultation and quote at info at arcreform.com. That's A-R-K reform, all one word, dot com, and give your home or commercial space the love and care that it deserves. Well, I think you've given me some great ideas here. I think what I'm reading, if I can just kind of say it back to it, is be tactful. Uh, try to find a way to at least get an offer in front of him so that he's aware that that there's an interested party. And if possible, I should stay out of the pic- being the foreigner. Absolutely. I should stay, yeah. stay out of the picture and and let my wife, who's a local, who's a local, knows the family and, and knows the local ways, let her lead the charge, which I'm not. Yeah, and I, all, I, I wouldn't even mention, like in her letter or offer i wouldn't even mention that she's lived in the states and coming back to japan just mention that you know she and her family are from the area and and she's interested in purchasing the house that's it i wouldn't add anything beyond that very good yeah i, I like that yeah right so just just keep the foreign element out if at all possible right correct yeah I mean, by the time by the time there's a signing of the contract and the deposit payment in front of him, then even obviously he might see your your name on the contract then. But it's rare that somebody will say no to the deposit and the sale when the money is right in front of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but having said that, Japan has its own unique type of mental health issues. It could be a hikikomori who just doesn't answer the door, doesn't read letters at all, and um, will not respond. I mean. 
I'm not saying slim chances, but I say there's a 50 50 percent chance that that might not not even work in far before we get to the contract signing part. Well, this is this is our you know when my daughter was going to university. We said you know apply to a couple of schools that you know you can get into and apply for a reach school, right? So this is our reach house, right? We yeah. would love to get this house. We've been inside the house. Uh, we know it's in good shape. At least it was the last time we were in there. Um, so, but if we can't get this, we have we have others um, that we're looking at, and I do have questions maybe I, relative to other other options that I would love to. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Well, great, and thank you very much for this information. This is really helpful. Um, I'm, I'm I really do appreciate it. Um, what what are some uh, common uh, pitfalls for foreigners in the Japanese real estate market? I listen to your podcast regularly, and I get some I get the basic impression that as we just discussed that if if it is at all possible for the foreigner to take a kind of a silent a, a mode when dealing with the owners and in particular with the real estate agents, that that's even if they speak Japanese well, that's the default position to take. Is that right? Um, yes. I mean, it's it's obviously it comes with caveats. So in bigger cities, they would be open. And recently these days, with the advance of um, Google Translate and other apps, some agents, because they recognize that, you know, there's a good potential buyers um, database for them to to tap into. So some of them do try to respond to emails and communicate. Mm -hmm. And there's a handful that we've worked with that have actually mapped out the process and can deal with a direct foreign purchase themselves. But the smaller the township, the more rural the area, the less that becomes likely. So Shizuoka City, I would probably, uh, we haven't investigated it much, but I'm assuming there'd be at least one or two English um, enabled agents, whether they can handle non-resident foreigners or not, I don't know, but you guys are relocating here anyway. Right. Um, but if you're talking about the little township surrounding it, then if it's a if it's a Shizuoka City agent that deals with these properties, maybe. Um, and you could definitely come in and say that you have someone like us, for example, who will be handling the... But once your wife gets her uh, Jumihyo and is actually a registered resident of Shizuoka City, mm -hmm. um, then she can handle all of the inquiries and processes on her own. They definitely won't say no to her. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I've got a, you know, I've got a Gaijin husband, but I'm I'm the one doing, I'm the one handling the purchase. Don't worry about that. You know? Got it. So we do in, in the community that we live in, when, when we live there, all of our, we, we were renting the whole time apartments and we went through one real estate agent and we have a great relationship. We lived in uh, three different places over the 15 years that we were there. They handled everything, including I had a business. We rented a business and they handled that. So they know us. They're friends of the family. Did they do sales too or just a rental agency? They do sales too. And yeah, so is your answer there. Did we reach out to them and connect up with them and say, hey, we're- That's the we're best back. way to start. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is that they could also, by the way, they could also help you with the first house because they, same as the Shihoshoshi, can go to the local legal affairs bureau, find out about the ownership, and present the offer as a you know as a vanilla real estate agent without any weirdness being involved. Um, and I think in most cases, because they work on a commission basis, in most cases they're not even going to charge you to find out the information. I mean, there might be some government fees to actually print out the documents, but that'll be about it, I think. Got it. Got it. Should we then expect, as happens in the States, that if they were to, if they then became our representing real estate agent, would we expect to see a, another agent on the other end for the buyer? Or I hear sometimes in Japan, one agent does both sides. Is that true? Yeah. So depends on from what you're saying, that house is probably not listed for sale anyway. So I don't see that there would be a seller side agent involved. It's more likely that the agent who will approach on your behalf is going to be servicing both sides in that case. But but even if there is a, a seller agent involved, it's not an, any extra cost to the buyer or the seller. It's just that that agent can't charge both sides because he charges the seller side and the buyer side charges the buyer side. So my question to you then is, bringing my American mindset in, I see a conflict of interest, interest having one agent representing both sides. That's not the case necessarily in Japan though, right? That's sometimes this happens, right? It's it's quite a common occurrence. And actually, well, two aspects to it. First off, the Japanese um, property transactions are very, very by the book, fully documented. All I mean, there's not going to be any monkey business involved. No one's going to um, sell you a lemon or misrepresent the property or anything of that sort. 
Um, but the other side of that is that whether the agent is um, somebody who comes in from the buyer side or the seller side, they're really, in most cases, very transactional in nature. So they're not going to misrepresent anything. They're definitely not going to lie. They're definitely not going to uh, pull any funny business, but they're also not going to point out things that you might want them to point out if they were indeed on your side, right? So for example, if we work with an agent and there's two or three properties, um, potential properties, they'll just give you the list and say, which one do you want? That'll be about it. They're not going to say, oh, you know, this one is a bit younger. This one looks like it might need more work. You might want to consider that they're just basically their job is there to facilitate the transaction and not much else. All right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I also I've, I've been I've been studying your podcast religiously. Yeah. <laughs> That's the appropriate word. And I, I did learn from you that um you don't want to burn real estate agents, right? You want to make sure that you treat them with respect. You don't make offers willy nilly or experimental test balloons, things like that. So especially in those smaller areas where there might be just a handful of agents that will work with you in the first place. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and also I'm hoping that this agent then, even if that house isn't available, they can then um, maybe have a network of agents and, and be able to have feelers and discover potential properties elsewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely awesome. do that. Yeah, and it is just to let you know this is as even though it's only a fifteen minute train ride by the little Chibi Maruko train that we drive out from downtown Shizuoka. This is very very rural mindset, very conservative community. You don't mess around out there. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of relationships and you know everybody's words. So my my another question I have along those lines is we have a budget, um, and um. How should we handle the offer? We're willing, and I probably shouldn't say this, we're willing to blow the whole budget on this place, almost sight unseen, um, yep. because this, this meets all of our needs. Should we just make an, should go to, should we tell that to the real estate agent? Here's how much we're willing to pay, or how should we approach that? Um, I would first get the agent to maybe try to assess how much the property's market price should be. Hmm. And then maybe go a little bit over that to make the offer more attractive. Um, but depends. I mean, if the price is, you know, close to zero because it's a, from what you're describing, it's a livable or semi-livable property, at least that won't require too much work. So I'm guessing it's not going to be one of those two, three, four million yen kind of uh, dilapidated akias in the countryside, probably a little bit better quality than that, right? It's in good shape, you know, from, from the walkthroughs I've done in the past. Yeah. So... Going off the area description that you've just given me, I'm assuming the price range would not be beyond 10, 15 million yen just because it's, it is quite rural. Um, so if your budget allows, maybe ask the agent what they think would be a super attractive offer and go slightly beyond that, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I see. So assess first, let the, let the realtor guide us a little bit and then maybe uh, try to sweeten the pot a little bit to make us stand out. I, although I don't know that there's necessarily any, it's been on, it's been there for four years. It's funny. You know how this is? I'm sure you're very, very well aware. Um, we, Shizuoka city, literally, if you, if you were to, to, to walk, um, 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes down the road, you'd be at the big train station, the JR train station. Yep. But yep. I've lived in Shizuoka for about a year. I know it well. My son was born in Shizuoka Hospital, actually. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. That's 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 fascinating. So you're, you're familiar with the Kusanagi area? Yeah, a little bit. Very good. So there's the museum there, right? Yep. So that the house is up there beyond the museum. It's just far enough up beyond the museum that from my wife's perspective, it's in the Anaka, right? Even though it's only yeah. a short so the mindset is such that it's too far away but you know to you and me and now my wife thankfully it doesn't seem to be too far away mm. I, i'm assuming you're going to have a car there right yeah yep yeah yeah so yeah i mean i guess uh, you're probably going to get a kind of funny estimate from a from a u.s perspective the price is probably going to be quite quite low um so i would go slightly over that but i think your main your main hurdle there is not going to be the price the main hurdle would be to get some sort of response from the uh, air if yeah. if if he is still the air i think yeah i think you're right you've given me some great tips on how to handle that um so yeah and i have another question about the multiple agents or one i think you've given me the result on that which is try to find this one agent especially we have we have a relationship let's try to work with them absolutely um, yeah should with uh, with regard to Akia banks, I don't know anything, and I haven't been able to find any good information about any Akia bank in Shizuoka. Is is this the type of thing that we should help ask the realtor to take a look at, or should we try to go through Akia banks ourselves? 
Um, the realtor will be able to check it out for you, but in some cases, what normally happens with Akia banks is that the local municipality appoints a particular agent to handle all of the Akias. And in those cases, a buyer agent might not be able to uh, to enter the fray, so, so to speak. But that, that that particular agent will definitely be able to find out for you. And if that's the case, he's going to tell you, look, I can't help with the Akia Bank properties, in which case you'll have to go direct. But again, definitely do that once you're a resident and once uh, and only via your wife. All right. Very good. Um, so and I have another one question regarding uh, um, houses that don't seem to be moving we i have a list i've been keeping the list for about a year now of of properties and we have some beautiful i mean just stunning properties that we've actually seen we went actually went out and visited while we were there and respectfully we didn't trespass we respectfully looked at them from a distance we did go with uh in one case we had one agent that allowed us to look at it but anyway the point is these properties are not selling. I mean, and some of them are, I mean, they're a little far out, maybe 20 minutes by car from Shizuoka up the Abe River, you know, the, uh, that, yep, that yep, area yep. there. So go up the Abe River and they're not selling and they've been the same price and just available for a year. What would your advice be if we chose to go for one of those? Is there, is there any other advice other than just go for it? Just offer the offer the listing price, yeah. But regardless of which property you're going to be purchasing, even if it's that one that you you know you're coveting at the moment or another one, um, considering the age of these properties and the fact that a lot of them have probably not been lived in for a while, I definitely and definitely um pen the offer on a structural inspection. So once the offer is accepted, then you commission a structural inspection just to make sure. We don't use this as a as a bargaining chip. We just want to make sure that you're not buying something that will suddenly cost you, you know, you buy the property for 5 million yen and you pay another 20 million yen because it's tilting or sinking or the whole roof needs to be done or whatever the case may be, right? We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's the thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. I think I heard, I think it was on your podcast there mm. that, you know, two things. One, you don't want to make an offer and then pull back necessarily. But the one way to, to handle that is to have a contingency on the offer, Correct. such as structural inspection. Would that be the, the route? You yeah. yeah, that's the way to do it. Wait, so make the offer and say, okay, well, here's the offer, but we want to have it inspected, do the inspection, and and then go from there, right? Yeah. I, I mean, if the house is, let's say, up to 20, 25 years old, then you can maybe forego that. But anything older than that, I definitely I definitely get that done. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, is that because of building codes after 20, 25 years? Are we in a better situation building codes wise? Not building codes. It's just, they're not really built to last. They're not built from very durable materials in Japan. So... 
past the 20, 25 years of age is when maintenance costs start um, piling up more significantly. And if the previous owners haven't done what they need to do, there could be a significant amount of work that needs to be done, structural damage, uh, termite infestations, all sorts of things. So I, I would definitely get that done if the house is older than 20, 25 years old. And also, if you happen, I, I'm not sure about that original house you're talking about, but if you happen to find houses that are pre-World War II, the old Cominca types with the big, huge wooden pillars and so, they're definitely built to last a lot more than the modern builds. Mm -hmm. um, but in that case, just watch out because any sort of work done on these will usually require a specialist that costs three, four times as much as normal um, modern uh, renovation companies. Right. Oh, very good. And just so you know, my, my father-in-law is a uh, Tataguya, uh, you know, Shoji screen, oh. uh, window and door maker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourth generation. So he's got a whole network of old of traditional craftsmen in the neighborhood. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my next question is, um, and by the way, thank you again as we're going for all this. This is really great information. Um, oh, regarding the, the the ones back on that one about the houses that, I'm, that aren't moving out, that are out in the distance, should that be the case where I go through this, try to go through this one real estate agent, bring that to them and say, hey, there's this house out here. Can you help us? With that, yep. is that the way to do it? Definitely, yeah. So even if it's listed on another realtor's website, I shouldn't be. I should. I should. I should get myself some help and use that help, or my wife will do that. The agent will tell you if they contact the listing. I mean, your agent will tell you if they contact the listing agent, and the listing agent staunchly refuses to share their commission, then they can't go through them. Then you have two options. Option one is, yeah, just have your wife contact the listing agent directly. Um, option two is to just. Uh, we do this with a bunch of agents. You'll need to explain it to your buyer side agent, but you can say, okay, well, don't don't let that agent keep their commission and we'll hire you not as a realtor per se, but as a facilitator or a translator and uh -huh. you invoice us for your commission separately. So in that case, you will pay the extra commission, but the listing agent will be amenable to sell the property to you because they don't have to sell, they don't have to share the commission and you will get the house that you really want. But I would definitely keep that strategy to the one kind of thing and only if it doesn't work in the normal way. I love that idea because part of the, what's important to me is I don't want to soil the relationship we have with this realtor who we, yeah. you know, they're, they're part of our life. Cool. Yeah, but the question is whether they'll be open to it because some realtors are really terrified of doing anything that might void their license in any way. Wow. So the concept, you know, that sort of creative thinking and, okay, you know, you're not charging me now as a realtor, you're charging me as a facilitator or a translator. So it's not your official commission and therefore you don't need to split it. Um, the buyer side agent, if they're not, but you're saying that one worked with you. And um, so they're probably at least a little bit used to working with foreigners, which hopefully means they're a bit more flexible and, and not as rigid in their thinking, but you know, see how you go. Yeah. yeah well, they're, they're used to, they're used to seeing me in the background while they're talking to my wife <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. and I never caused any problems and always paid my rent. So they're, they were happy with that. Yeah. So the next question I have, this is a big one. This one. Um, so we have our budget. It's here in the United States. Uh, and I'm not sure about the best, safest, and most expeditious way to get the money into Japan to be available to make a, a large purchase like this. Do you have? Does your wife questions? still have her Japanese bank account? She does, although she hasn't accessed it for ten years, so we don't know if it's still there. But the first thing she does when she gets on the ground is to try to get that in order. Um, well, I wouldn't approach the bank before she gets her residency sorted. So the first step should be to go to City Hall, to the Shiaksho, and register yourself as a returning resident of Japan. Get your Jumihyo, which shows that you're actually now living in Japan. And then it should be easy enough for her to reactivate the account. Because if you approach them without that, they might say, oh, hang on, you've been living overseas, account frozen. We're not allowed to let you access it anymore. Right. So First, especially get to, because of what they're afraid of is the money laundry. And this looks especially suspicious, right? Correct. So first thing is to get her residency sorted out. And when she does approach the bank, show them that she has a Jumihyo address certificate now, and she actually lives in Japan. Then once the account is definitely accessible, then, I mean, don't let your bank exchange your dollars into yen for you. Use a, a, a Forex provider. We work with OFX. I can send you a referral link to them. 
I do have an OFX account. Yeah, you do. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'm trying to get everything set up. I was going between Wise, Wise, and OFX. OFX seem more for larger option. transfers. They're definitely better uh, because Wise can only transfer up to one million yen at a time. So you keep getting um, you keep getting oh, charged for for the entire amount split into one million remittances. Um, I OFX see. are better. When did you sign up with them? OFX probably three months ago. I okay. Haven't done you haven't done anything with them yet? No, I just have the account. Um, so I I can try to, I'm assuming you heard about OFX through our podcast. Let's assume that you heard about OFX through our podcast. So I, if you remind me via email, I'll put you in touch with a corporate account manager there. I'll ask her to associate your account with um, our referral, which means oh. that they'll charge you a bit less fees, but more importantly, you'll have access to our corporate account manager and she helps makes everything very, very smooth. That that's going to lead into one of my last questions here about about uh, we're very interested in 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 think, finding ways that you know to to potentially leverage your your services right even though my wife is a native Japanese if there's things that we can do to help facilitate things and overcome hurdles then we're very interested in that. Well, what about so I'm very nervous about about you know moving a large chunk of money like this. Do I are, are my if I'm using OFX do I need to be less concerned? I mean, none of these companies, Wise included, none of these companies can operate without going through very stringent. I mean, they're basically, um, it's the same sort of licensing that a bank would have to get before they can facilitate these kind of international transactions. So I, I would definitely not be concerned about that. What are your thoughts about, because I would love to lock in the good exchange rate we have right now. And I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to probably do this in around December, probably pull the trigger and move the money over to Japan, or at least move it into yen and, and lock it in that way. Um, would but you is that going to be before your wife visits here and gets her Jumihyo? Well, good, good point, right? No, we don't want to do it until she's got the account to put it into, right? Yeah, I mean, she can, she should be able to transfer. The way it works is the bank is probably because she hasn't contacted them when she left, I'm assuming. So the bank is probably not aware that she's no longer residing in Japan. Right. So technically, what will probably happen is that they'll, def they'll receive the transfer and they let her and they, I mean, they will agree to receive the funds from overseas. But what happens when they receive especially large amounts from overseas is they try to contact the um the owner of the account to to find out what the purpose of the transfer was and where the money is coming from and if then they ring her registered phone number in Japan and get no reply then that's when they'll enter panic mode and potentially freeze the account right or Got just it. reject the transfer and return it to you in the best case scenario so number one i would definitely do that does she have any other relatives that you can trust with receiving the account on her behalf just going to ask you about that. Her sister, may, she, I was wondering if we, but I don't want to get her her sister in any trouble or have any tax liability or any irregularities if we did that. But Well, she'll sister, have to explain, same thing. They'll contact her and she'll have to explain what this money is, where it's coming from. And once she says it's not my money, then it could be, um, could be rejected as well, right? So how about given that, so probably the best thing to do is to hold on to it until we're ready, until my wife has everything arranged and get it into a, the proper account and she's and she's able to answer those questions. Is there any recommendation that you would have that we could lock so that we could convert it into yen in the current good rate um, and then hold it in that way? Um, not OFX. not with OFX. Uh, I think Wise might have that option, like a kind of multi-currency account where you can just lock in the rates yes. and change over to yen and hold it there. But I'm not sure. You'll have to look on their website. It doesn't. Just... I've tested it. I've actually moved a pretty good chunk of money into Wise, did the currency exchange. And, I and actually... it's sitting there? It's just sitting there. Yeah, sitting there in yen. And then I, not only that, when my daughter went to Japan, I, I got a wise ATM card and I sent her to Japan this last summer. I said, try to pull it out. And I, I watched her be able to pull it out because I wanted to see what the rates would be. Of course, we're yeah. not going to ATM it, right? But I yeah. just wanted to see if it would work. Okay, so how, how big was that? Was that more than 1 million yen? No, no, it was no, it was only a couple hundred dollars. It wasn't much. Well, check and see if they'll accept a larger transfer without charging you extra fees per million yen, which I think is what they might do. But it could be it could be the case that they're only charging that extra when you're actually transferring it to a Japanese bank account. I'm not sure how the system works exactly. The thing the thing I'm worried about is 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 doing that, excuse me, doing that, doing that in December and having like 10 million yen in sitting in wise for half a year or something like that just doesn't feel very safe um 
it, it's safe enough. The only thing I'm wondering is what happens when you then want to withdraw it into your wife's bank account. Because once you remit the funds into an actual Japanese bank account, I think that's when their 1 million yen remittance uh, limit kicks in. Uh -huh. So it could be that, again, you'll be charged 10 times whatever the receiving bank charge is, which could be two, $300. So, I mean, it's not going to break the bank, but it maybe is... It it yeah. might be worth it if we can lock in the good rate, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That'll be one way to do it. The other way is if you, I don't think you need our services to facilitate the purchase, but if you sign on as our customer, then we can receive funds from you as long as they're related to property purchases, not anything else, then we can receive funds from you and hold them until then. But again, I don't think you, to be honest, if you need our services for anything, it may be to look over the contract, commission the structural inspection, stuff like that. I don't think you need us to facilitate everything. So yeah, I understand. I understand that you do that. And I understand that you have the full the full package, but then you also have like the hourly rate type of correct thing. consulting. Yeah. So we might, yeah, might indeed. That's the angle I was thinking is the hourly consulting more sessions like this to get, to get that advice, look over things and maybe help facilitate the transfer of money in an effective way. That would be. So we can do, so with a, um, with the consulting, we usually don't require that the customer gives us a POA or signs a contract of services because we're just going to be advising you on an hourly basis. But if the purpose is to also use us to transfer the funds, then we can go through the motions of official facilitation and get you to sign the documents that enable us to represent you. And then we can also receive funds for you, even if we're just charging you by the hour. Now, here's some big news for anyone interested in Akia, the abandoned vacant homes that are abundant all around Japan for very attractive purchase prices. Akia Mart, our latest sponsor, is a recently founded online search and discovery tool for Japanese real estate. Its user interface will be very familiar to users of Zillow or Redfin. The platform essentially scouts the internet for property listings, translates them into English and displays prices in US dollars, all in one place and with a dynamic map interface that makes browsing, finding and shortlisting your favorite properties a piece of cake which any of you have been struggling with the dozens, if not hundreds, of Japanese property websites that are available online and their very clunky interface will probably find a real blessing. They've got already over half a million listings on the platform and the database is expanding daily, ranging from abandoned rural homes to luxury urban properties. Akia Mart makes it easy to find your dream home in Japan, regardless of your budget. Now, while the platform is essentially free for use, here's an exclusive offer for listeners of the podcast. You can use the promo code NTI to receive $5 off Akia Mart Pro. The subscription will unlock a bunch of very attractive features for you, including unrestricted access to the entire nationwide property database and a whole range of filters, which will help power charge your search for that elusive perfect home and make it even easier. So hop over to akia-mart.com, that's A-K-I-Y-A-M-A-R-T, akia-mart.com, and kick off your search today. All right. So that's an option as well, yeah. So I would... Look into the wise option first. Just see see whether they will indeed charge you for um, 10 remittances or just the one when you pull out the five. The, the problem with wise is it's difficult to communicate. There's not really a personal service there, hmm. which is, again, the main reason that we prefer OFX because we always talk to the same person and that she goes out and finds the answers to any questions and handles stuff. I don't think you can get that with WISE. So you can contact the support center, but it's just a random person asked, uh, replying every time. So I actually, with WISE, I, I actually found their reference. I cannot remember where it was. It was a reference to uh, uh, someplace and, I, and it was for zero tr transfer fees. So I signed up using that reference code and then I called them up and talked to their support and said, do I really have zero transfer fee? And they, the, the support agent said, yeah. And, and they said, you do for life. Okay, well then just contact them again and ask them um, if I transfer, tell them the exact amount. If I transfer 10 million yen, convert it to Japanese yen, let you hold it. And then next year, I want to pull that into my wife's bank account in Japan. What fees would be involved then? Beautiful, Just beautiful. Yeah. great advice. That's what I'll do. Am I doing? I have a few more questions. Am I doing okay on time, Ziv? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Not a problem. I'll just connect the uh, PC charger because I'm running out of battery. Yeah, go for it. Very good. Thank you. Um, so uh, we talked about the money transfer. Thank you. Great information. Um, uh, regarding the money thing. So uh, back on the money thing. So um, I will be retiring, and I but I will have a pension, a regular pension um, coming in from 
the United States. Yep. My question is, what if we were in a situation situation where we wanted to do something big, like, uh, you know, re rebuild, you know, do, remodel the house in some big way or something like that. Given that we are retired pensioners getting a regular income from the, from a foreign country, does that mean we are utterly ineligible to get a reef, you know, a loan from a Japanese bank? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, if your income is not generated in Japan, either via a Japanese company that you own or as a salary from a Japanese entity, most likely not. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, but is there any way... You're saying it's a pension payment, so it's not actual work uh, that you're getting paid for by a company, right? That's right. It's a, it's, it's a very large... It's, it's probably the largest uh, union, in the, one of the largest unions in the United States. Okay, so there's no option for you to like set up a Japanese company and invoice them so that the income looks like it's coming from a Japanese business, right? I don't know. I mean, probably, yeah, I'm, I I'm guessing not. <laughs> okay, probably not. <laughs> In that case, yeah, then you're probably not, unfortunately, probably not going to be eligible for loans. Mm, maybe I can do so, given that the money income in the States, maybe I can get a loan in the United States. Maybe. Hmm, we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that'll be, I'm not, I'm supposing that U.S. lenders will not lend for a mortgage. Uh, like, for example, renovation costs are often covered as part of a mortgage in Japan. Uh, right, but right. Because U.S. banks don't tend to lend for a property related business overseas, it'll probably have to be a like a personal loan or a line of credit, and then interest rates are going to be very high, I assume. I was hoping to, to lock in some of those sweet rates that I keep hearing you, hearing you talk about. <laughs> but but like you said, without they're going to want to see the solid, especially if, with a foreigner in the, in the picture, right? they want to see a solid job history, no change in the job, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. It's not even a foreigner aspect. It's more a case of where is the income coming from? And if it's not coming from within Japan or a Japanese entity, that's going to be an issue for them. But your daughter would be able for a loan once she works for about a year in Japan and you can just have a private memorandum with her whereas you pay her and she she gets the loan right that's a good point right interesting um okay another question is um uh, what are the pros and cons well I, I guess I guess we've they've already come out through this conversation um of 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 using a service like yours uh for uh, people in our in our situation um a service as in consulting is definitely can, definitely can be useful if you've never purchased a property in Japan. But considering the fact that your wife is Japanese, speaks, reads, writes, fluent Japanese, you definitely don't need us for full facilitation. It'll be a waste of your money. Can I give you a commercial for your, a commercial for your business? Even, yeah, though, sure. that, even though that may be the case, um, I, I listen to your podcast regularly. And then when my wife and I are in the evening walking our dogs, I talk to her about what I learned. Both of us, even though she's a Japanese national, both of us, our peace of mind, our sense of confidence has increased by virtue of what we've learned from watching and listening to your podcast. I appreciate so, that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I would I would I would add, and I, my wife and I already had the conversation, and we were thinking if we could if we can go into this and then have your agency um, in, in whatever capacity assisting, it would be worth the extra expense, even though we have a national on our team. <laughs> We're happy to, but um, our, our minimum for uh, houses as opposed to condo units is 5% uh, of 10 million yen, even if the property is cheaper, just because there's a huge amount of work involved with uh, when you're purchasing the entire structure. Right. So, I don't know. You're talking about a budget of 10 million yen. That's an extra 5% on top, right? Right, right. Yeah, understood. And so uh, we do understand that you do the consulting as well, but we may be open to either path. Uh, piece We're happy to. We definitely have some clients who are residing in Japan, do speak the language, but just don't want to be involved directly. And they want you know somebody to do everything for them. Uh, I, I get that. And we do that. I'm just, I'm, I'm reluctant to recommend that course of action to somebody who can actually do it themselves, but we're happy to. That's one of the reasons why I like you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting how these things work on podcasts and YouTube and et cetera. You feel like you get to know people that you've never met, right? So <laughs> thank you for that. And so, and to the other people that you, some the other co-hosts that you have sometimes on your podcast as well, I, I, it's, I really do appreciate all the information that they all provide. I think the last question that I had here was, or I had last question and then I had one question from someone I, I, I on my social media, I mentioned I would be here today and I asked if anybody had a question. There's one last question from somebody else but before that my last uh 
Um, oh, I think I've already answered that one. Nope. Then let's go to the question from uh, my friend, Tony, who wanted to know, um, how can foreigners, I'm reading directly from it, how can foreigners be accepted by neighbors in Japan more quickly and settle into the community? That's a really good question. Um, so sometimes it just can't be done, right? If you've got an annoying neighbor who's just not friendly, then usually they're not going to be friendly to Japanese as well. It's not a foreigner thing. They're just, they're just, you know, old, old, old buggers who don't want to talk to anyone. So sometimes it can't be helped. Um, other cases, so sometimes it's older people, usually older men who have that approach. And sometimes it's, again, um, young or middle-aged hikikomori types who don't talk to anyone. But aside from that, assuming all things being equal, the way to think about it is they're they're going to be shocked at your appearance in the community anyway. Whether that shock then translates into fascination and an openness or into cold shoulders and, and uh, you know, aloof kind of stares, it's really up to how... Um, how open you for example when we move to a new house in japan we do the your wife i'm sure knows that we do the rounds between at least the adjacent neighbors maybe two or three doors down the street as well introducing ourselves with a bit of cake or, or anything like that and that's the know. time for you to come in in full family mode uh, again you're used to kind of standing in the back and and i'm assume i'm assuming your daughter might join you as well and just be the the warm kind of um, welcoming family that they're used to seeing also really important to participate in all of the local neighborhood community efforts, the cleaning, the paying the fees for, uh, you know, mowing the trees in the local park once a year, uh, go to the Matsuri and, and, you know, donate to the temple when there's a, when there's a holiday happening, that sort of thing. Just do that persistently over a period of time. And what you don't want to do is obviously what they're not used to. So, Loud music, loud parties, um, you know, renting out short-term stay to all kinds of foreigners that come in at strange hours of the day and night with suitcases and stuff like that. Those are all things that are bound to get you um, get you into their uh, black books very quickly. But other than that, it's yeah, you you do your best. You try to uh, you try to blend in with the local community by following whatever the other people are following in the local community, and just hope that you don't have any annoying neighbors, but, which is often going to be the case regardless of what you do. So don't take it personally. Yeah. Humans are humans after all. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Great. Wow. Uh, Ziv, you've been so helpful. This is really heartening. I have taken some good notes about how we will proceed with our, our, our effort to hopefully secure this, this dream house, the reach house, and how we might proceed with uh, other houses in the meantime, as well as begin testing the uh, mechanism of making the money transfer uh, in, in a safe and efficient manner. And how, how would I, if I wanted to engage your services further, how would I proceed to do that? Just send me an email and we'll get we'll get the ball rolling. But regardless of that, I'd be happy to um, get some updates. And once there's enough of them, maybe we can have you back to uh, to tell us how the process went. I would be delighted to do that. That would, that would be, great. be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Kurt. Speak to you soon. Good luck. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. So there you have it. Huge thanks to Kurt for all the kind words. Always great to hear that someone is finding value in what we do. It's a real pleasure to know that people are really enjoying the content. And speaking of value, if you're a listener of this podcast, you'd be crazy to miss out on the best value offer of the season, the April 6th Japan Real Estate Summit in Tokyo. I mean, just the list of speakers, Tracy Northcott from Tokyo Family Stays, Blanca Kobayashi from Arc Reform, Emil Gorgis from realestate.jp, Joey Stockermans from Akia Mart, Anton Warman, which, I mean, if you don't know who Anton is, I mean, you must be living under a rock. Daigo Sato-san from Sato Tax and Accounting. And of course, yours truly talk about value, but really the best value in these events are you, the participants, chatting with you, seeing you, getting to know each other at these events, hearing and answering your questions. That's really the best value possible for us, the organizers. Can't wait to see you with us in a couple of weeks, live in Akihabara, Tokyo, or in the streaming Zoom room. Hop over to nippontradings.com if you haven't yet, and grab your tickets. We will see you all very, very soon. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, 
or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!